Welcome to Remember, Remember, the show about histories, mysteries, and did you know that an estimated three to 500,000 people traveled the Oregon Trail between 1841 and 1884? At least 20,000 died on that trail. And today we are talking about the most famous, the most sensationalized, the most cannibally of those people, the Donner Party. This isn't going to be a fun episode for anybody involved, so buckle up. <laughs> Today, things indeed get a bit more tragic in this part two of our look at the Donner Party. Joining me on this descent to hell is my co-host, the one who's going to crack a joke at just the right moment to keep things from getting too sad. No pressure. Matthew. Hello. <laughs> so the weight of comedy pressure crunches down. I feel it all the time. It's a constant it's a constant drudge in my life. And I'm Paula. The one who'll be saying all the sad and gruesome stuff. You are already sad. I am already sad. Last we left off, our party of eighty seven had barely survived crossing the Great Salt Lake Desert. They were low on supplies, had abandoned wagons full of belongings, caching many items they were hoping to come back for later and retrieve, had lost most of their cattle and oxen, and had sent two men on horseback ahead of them to try to get supplies from Fort Sutter so that the 29 men, 15 women, and 43 children could survive the rest of the journey to California. Oh, and it was September. The question, are we there yet, should have been answered with, yes. By this point. <laughs> but they still have a quarter of the trip to go. Man, which is like a month and a half, right? Yeah. Jeez. They finish with the disastrous Hastings cutoff and reconnect to the standard trail at the end of September, having traveled an extra 125 miles. So not 200 less. Correct. 150 more. Yeah. I don't think this Hastings guy gets brought to justice at the end of this, but he should have been tried and put away for a very long time. Matthew has strong feelings about Hastings. I think this guy promised that there was a shortcut, paid off people. He's a con man. Yeah. He is he's literally a con man, and I feel like he should be brought to justice. His actions... Manslaughter, right? I mean, his... Yeah, his actions led to this tragedy, really. Right? Because without That's him... That's not in the comments below what you think. <laughs> without him, they would have just stayed on the trail and gone to Fort Hall and been fine. Yeah I'm, a, yeah, I'm annoyed. At this point, I'm sure you can imagine how also annoyed the people in the Donner Party are. Apoplectic, I imagine. <laughs> How much resentment they might have toward their leaders who convinced them to travel this way. George Donner yeah. and James Reed. I not thought about that because they're probably blaming them rather than you believe this guy, this high, this tall tale of this guy and you, we went this way, this is your fault. Because in those situations, you want to blame someone because you don't want it to be yeah. your fault. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. I can't imagine arguing, though. Made the trip any quicker. Sure did. Which is what I would have said if I was leading. I'd say, you can argue with me all day, you want it all night. It's fine, but it's not going to get us to California any quicker. <laughs> we will turn these wagons around. And that is said, I am going to shoot you. And I said, it's not going to get to California any quicker. <laughs> On October 5th, the party was at Gravelly Ford, which I've just now appreciated what a kind of a silly name that is. Gravelly Ford. I wonder what it was like. What if it was... Do you think there was gravel there? I imagine it was a ford, somewhat gravelly in nature. <laughs> so they're attempting to climb a steep, sandy hill with their wagons. Oh, Sandy Hill. I know it well. It's a great place. Yeah. Why isn't it called Sandy Hill? In order to do this, they needed to double the teams. I resisted making a double team joke here. I almost did. Paula, this isn't all about your fantasies. And then I thought maybe Matthew would make it. And then I thought, well, I'll yeah. say it before he does. They doubled the teams of oxen on each wagon, sharing their livestock in turns to get all the wagons up the hill. Now, there are, of course, conflicting reports about what happens next. 
but it appears as though two of the members started arguing over the way these oxen were being treated. John Snyder was relying heavily on his whip to get the oxen he was using to move, and Milton Elliott didn't like that. I would be conflicted in these situations because I am very against horse racing, for instance. Mm. If you are into horse racing, you do you. But I'm really (laughs) not. I think it's quite cruel and whipping a horse for entertainment, I think, is fairly barbaric. Again, that's just my opinion. But in this situation, which is, let's face it, life and death at this point because they're running low on supplies and winters are coming to the mountains, I think having a high and mighty moral stance on how much you're whipping your oxen is probably a little bit ridiculous at this point. Well, here's a a counter argument to that. James Reed tries to intervene on this, reminding John Snyder that the oxen are already exhausted and... They need them to survive, and whipping them in this way could cause injuries or wear them out more. Yeah, that they will be less useful later on because they've been taken past the point of exhaustion. And if the oxen can't move at all because of exhaustion, literal exhaustion, for two or three days, then that's going to slow them down even further Mm -hmm. than how quick they get up this hill. I can see that argument as well. Fair enough. I think they should give the medals in horse races, Paula, to the horses. They do all the running. Should the medals be made out of, like, carrots or something so the horses can, like, I think so. enjoy them to their fullest extent? I think they should be sugar cubes and carrots, and I think the jockeys should get a smaller medal. Well, their frames are so small. They can only hold They'd... up so much around their necks, really. Exactly. exactly. A gold medal around a jockey's neck is just ridiculous at this point. <laughs> so they're arguing, and James Reed is like, look, we have a committee for settling disputes. We will deal with this later when we're all over this hill. And John Snyder reportedly says, we'll settle it now. Things get heated. Snyder starts whipping around with his whip. He cuts James Reed across the face. Just shoot this guy. In the tussle, Reed's wife, Margaret, ends up in the middle of things trying to stop it. She gets caught by the butt end of Snyder's whip and gets injured. Enraged, Reed pulls out a knife and stabs John Snyder in the chest, who dies. Now, I can imagine that the person with the whip going, let's call it Buck Wild, (laughs) is probably struggling just as much as everyone else is. But everyone else is struggling. That's really not an excuse to be, to go have a To be physically, yeah. I wasn't there. And we've all had episodes in our lives, but... Yeah, it's the 1800s. I mean, people people duel all the time still. People are still, it's the, This is literally the Wild West. Shooting yes. someone or dueling someone or stabbing someone. That's just part and parcel of the whole thing. But I can see this from both sides, I suppose. But I don't know if someone punched my wife, if I had one, I'd probably be angry as yeah. well. Well, and there, are different, there are different feelings about James Reed. So some people are like... This was uncalled for. He shouldn't have killed any, you know, he he shouldn't have done this. Uh, It wasn't that big of a deal. And then some people are like, wow, as soon as he did this, he was like, oh, fuck, what did I do? I can't believe I just stabbed and killed this guy. We don't know. We weren't there. But the committee that's been appointed for settling disputes now has to decide how to react to this incident. Louis Kiesberg suggests hanging Reed for murder. But it's decided instead that he should be banished from the party, leaving behind his wife and children to stay with the party. That's so dumb. That's like so... An able-bodied man during this time is so stupid. That's... What's he going to do? Like walk 20 paces behind him the whole rest of the way? I think he ends up with a horse so he can actually... He can ride on ahead. I'm actually not sure if he had a horse or if he walked. But he can go quicker on his own, but... Give me a horse. I'll be off in Cal- I'll be off California way. Yeah. He leaves alone, determined to try to get aid and supplies to bring back to his family on the trail as a way to turn these lemons into lemonade. Ironically, he's going to survive this whole thing, isn't he? And his family's going to die. Is my guess. 
It's a morbid guess. I'll <laughs> give you that. But that's my guess, nonetheless. Let's see. Well, let's see what happens. Meanwhile, the rest of the party kept getting lemons. Uh, they had stopped setting up protections around their camps at night. Because they're exhausted. Because they're exhausted and upset and they're not really friends with each other anymore, you know. As a result, their supplies and cattle are getting stolen by the Native Americans in the area. So even more things are being lost now that they need. The trek was also difficult and the animals were completely worn out. So for the oxen to pull the wagons, people couldn't ride in them. They all had to start walking to try to alleviate as much weight from the wagons as possible for the animals. And these are kids, a lot of these people, A lot right? of them are kids, yeah. One of them is an older gentleman, Mr. Hardcoop, who is in poor health and struggling to walk. He had been riding in the Keysburg wagon, but Lewis Keysburg, the one who wanted to hang James Reed, had kicked him out and was like, everyone else is walking, you have to walk too. Hardcoop falls behind, is left on the trail, and never catches back up. Jesus, bloody hell. Yeah. That's barbaric. It's pretty bad. A man named Wolfinger went missing. He had been driving his family's wagon at the back of the train with his wife walking near the front. When camp was made that night, he never arrived. Some people went back on the trail to look for him and found his wagon abandoned with his belongings. A few days later, two other men, Spitzer and Reinhardt, made it into camp after having been gone for a few days. Wolfinger's wife noticed they had her husband's gun. They claimed Native Americans had attacked and killed and carried off her husband. That's what I heard happened. But the people who had found the abandoned wagon were like, there was no sign of that. Nothing was stolen. And they weren't so sure that that's actually what happened. It's quite obviously not what happened, right? Later, one of them will confess to killing Wolfinger. But it's hard to know if that is done just because they're delirious with death. Hunger and thirst and death, yeah. Or if it's real. (sighs) In my mind as well, they are sticking together. They're in a big group moving as one unit. Especially when you've got Native American people possibly picking up weaker stragglers and that type of thing. And you've got elderly people. I would think that you would move more like a wolf pack with your weakest up front yeah. and the strongest at the, ba- at the back because that's your best chance of survival as a group. But I think at this point, they aren't thinking with a group mentality. Yeah. I think there's a lot of... They're probably thinking not everyone's making this trip. Yeah. So and I, I want to be sure one of the I'm ones one of that the one. make yeah, it. exactly. Which is a human emotion and a totally acceptable and understandable way to think, but it's not conducive to the survival of the group at all because, because enough people get picked off then the wolf pack isn't strong enough to defend itself at at all, including from the elements. I mean, granted, they've got no food and they've got no, and you know, supplies go further with less people, which is probably something that's on a lot of people's minds. But yeah, it's crazy. I'm surprised that they didn't find any other settlements, any other, but I suppose there just isn't anything. There isn't anything here. There's just nothing there yet. Other than the Native Americans, there really isn't anything on this stretch. It's difficult for my mind to comprehend that is just completely unsettled yeah. land, like permanent settlements. Because this, I mean, yes, you could get lost in the mountains in, in Wales if you wanted to. But if you just walk in a straight line for long enough, mm-hmm. it won't take you many days to bump into civilization in the entirety of Europe, pretty much. Unless you're stuck in the middle of the Black Forest or something. You know, I mean... You just pick a straight line and you'll meet civilization. But that just wasn't the case there, I suppose. Yeah. You had to get to California or bust, right? Which was the thing. That, yeah. That's the whole point of the trip. It is interesting to think that less than 200 years ago in this country, in the U.S., there was totally unsettled, huge unsettled swaths of land, right? Not counting, you know, the areas, of course, that Native Americans had settled But still, even with that, huge swaths of unsettled land. When you have in the UK, you know, buildings that have been around since. My brother's house was predates the British Civil War in the 1500s. That's, you know, so so it's crazy. I I think a lot of people, I mean, obviously there are certain Native American tribes who have agriculture and settled Mm -hmm. land. And it's not just a complete roaming population. Mm -hmm. 
depends where you are and it depends what kind of agriculture you can sustain yeah. and all that type of stuff but it's just, yeah, it's just crazy that there's just it's a massive country and there's yeah. nothing really there so they make it to present day reno where william pike dies in a gun accident shot by his own brother-in-law that's gotta feel bad oh but what's that a fresh glass of lemonade matthew oh joy charles stanton who had left to ride ahead to fort sutter to ask for aid and supplies returns to the party he brought with him those supplies along with two milwaukee native americans who knew where the hell they were going yeah, i'm assuming they knew the area <laughs> they were called Luis and Salvador. I want to acknowledge that I am certain these are not their given names. These are not their birth names. I'm pretty sure this is what the Spanish in the area yeah. decided to call them. But this is how they're known, Luis and Salvador. So they come with Charles Stanton with supplies from Fort Sutter to help guide the party the rest of the journey. Uh, there had been another man who went with uh, Stanton, if you remember, William McCutcheon, yeah. who had left his wife and son back with the party. He had fallen ill, so he has stayed at Fort Sutter. He has not come back. Okay. At this point, I, I want to take a moment to point out that Charles Stanton was a 20-something single man. He had no other connections to anyone in the Donner Party. But he chose to come he back. He chose to, to come to back help. to help them. He did not have to do that. He was at Fort Sutter. He had made it. But he came back. Good man. How could you not go back? Is part yeah. I just in, in, but then again, I wasn't there, and I might be thinking you'd go back because you know you would because there's people that you need help, but and they're relying on you, and they probably the do hand, also care about them. He has been traveling with them for like five months. Months. You know? Yeah. But on the other hand, you might think you could justify things in your mind and go, even if I go back, I can't help them. They're yeah. dead anyway. Yeah. You know, and I, I think you could easily justify that in your own mind and come to reconcile that with yourself. So it's now the end of October, and they are about to enter Truckee, California, and make the final journey through the Sierra Nevadas. Just two more weeks to go. And then, unseasonably early, yeah, it starts to snow. Which doesn't feel like is a thing that happens in the Sierra Nevada because you, I've, it's California and it feels like there shouldn't be any snow, but great skiing in Reno. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, this is, we're you in the Tahoe I mean? area at this point. Yeah. So yeah, it's known for its skiing. It's where our snowpack basically is. It's, yeah. It's just the altitude. You forget how the high it is. It's yeah. the, the altitude is so high. It's all downhill once you pass there, but yeah. it's, at that point, you're still in the Rocky Mountains mm -hmm. to a great extent. So Jeez. we've, come to the part of the story that made the Donner Party famous. One of the party members, Patrick Breen, uh, from Deep Space Nine, begins yeah. keeping a journal. And this is one of the only contemporary records we have of what happens next. Typically, even though they're behind schedule, they would still have about a month to make it through the mountain pass of the Sierra Nevadas before winter weather fucks them. But this year, it starts snowing on Halloween. They attempt to go through the pass anyway, but the snow is so deep they can't find the trail, so they turn back to Truckee Lake, hoping to be able to try again as soon as the snow stops. But it doesn't stop, and they keep having failed attempts at crossing the mountains. It snows for eight days, and the party hunkers down. They're split at this point into two groups. So the Donners actually fell behind the rest of them because they had an accident. They had a broken wagon axle that they were trying to yeah. repair. While they were doing that, George Donner like cuts his hand. He gets this really bad injury, which never heals. It's nasty. So they stop and set up camp at Alder Creek, making shelters out of canvas from their wagons and just like brush. Six miles further down the trail is the rest of the party who are camping at Truckee Lake, which will become known as Donner Lake. There are some previously built cabins there from um, other immigrants in past years who have had to stay there for some amount of time. So the Breen family takes one of the cabins. The Keysbergs make kind of a lean-to against that cabin that they use for themselves. They build a cabin up against a large boulder. You can The cabin's not there anymore, but the boulder is. Like You could go to Truckee Lake and and see the boulder they built this up against. I probably don't want to, yeah. but yes. It's going to uh, be a sad place. The Eddie, Foster, Murphy, and Pike family share that cabin. 
And then the Graves and Reed families use this like double cabin that was already there that I guess had just had a wall down the middle. From this period of time, most of Patrick Breen's journal entries read like, snow again, can't cross the mountains. Looks like snow, tried to cross, had to turn back. Got more snow last night, getting colder. Oh fuck, more snow. At least they got drinking water, I suppose. That's true. If it'll, if they can get it to melt. A month in to staying here. His journal reads A like month this. in? A month in. Here They're it- going to be here for the whole... All winter, this... Ca- uh, di- oh. They're basically prepared to stay until spring at this point. No, they're not. <laughs> they are not prepared to stay till spring. <laughs> what are they eating? How many? How much supplies was... They're eating almost nothing at this point. So here's how his journal reads. November 29th. Jeez. S- still snowing. Now about three feet deep. Wind west. Killed my last oxen today. Gave another yoke to foster. Wood hard to be got. November 30th. Snowing fast. Looks as likely to continue as when it commenced. No living thing without wings can get about. December 1st. Still snowing. Wind west. Snow about six or six and a half feet deep. Very difficult to get wood, and we are completely housed up. Our cattle all killed but two or three, and these, with the horses and Stanton's mules... (sighs) The mules that Stanton brought back from Fort Sutter to help them. All supposed to be lost in the snow. No hopes of finding them alive. December 3rd. Ceases snowing. Cloudy all day. Warm enough to thaw. December 4th. Beautiful sunshine. Thawing a little. Looks delightful after the long storm. Snow seven or eight feet deep. Seven or eight feet deep? Yeah. And that's not as deep as it gets. I've never seen... It's hard to believe it can snow that much anywhere. (laughs) It just doesn't stop. It just keeps snowing. It's insane. Some of the party members at this point, because the weather's turned a little nicer, start making snowshoes. They want to choose a small group of the strongest people to try to cross the mountains and go for help. I mean, people are at this point starting to weaken from lack of food. And on December 14th, a month and a half after reaching Truckee Lake, Bayless Williams dies. On December 16th, a party of 17 set out with snowshoes to cross the mountains. They are led by Charles Stanton and guided by Luis and Salvador, the Native Americans who came with Stanton from Fort Sutter. I bet they're regretting signing on to this trip. Jeez. I actually, I don't think they had a choice. The person who ran Fort Sutter basically gifted them to Charles Stanton. So it's even worse. Like... Yeah. This group will later be known as the Forlorn Hope. If you want to have any idea what, how things are going to turn out for them. Two of this party can't keep up, so they turn back and go and go back to Truckee Lake, but the rest keep going. It's five women, nine men, and one child. He's 12 or 13. They have six days of starvation rations with them. About a week into their trek... They're out of food, they're cold, they're wet, and they're going snow blind. Or basically there's so much snow that they they can't see. It's like too much of the reflection, I think, back up yeah. into their eyes has damaged them. That's the first thing you should do if you're struggling in a snowy situation is cover your eyes if, mm. with some description. There's very traditional things that tribes wear mm. in the very north, mm-hmm. who you would, Inuits and mm. people mm-hmm. like that, and they're just little slits in like wood. Oh, interesting. Just a tiny little slit to know stop that. the sun. Yeah, to stop the sun reflecting wow. in your eyes. That's really interesting. So Charles Stanton, who is now crossing this pass for the third time, <laughs> is fully snowblind and weak and worried about being a burden to the rest of the party. God. One morning he tells them, Go ahead, he'll catch up. And instead, he sits by their small fire, smoking his pipe, and he never gets up again. Yeah. His body is later found by one of the rescue parties who comes through. He was a real hero. He absolutely was a hero. Things are getting dire for the forlorn hope. They start pulling apart their snowshoes to eat the leather that was used to make them. Yeah. 
This is the first time, apparently, that cannibalism comes up. They start talking about how maybe one of them should sacrifice themselves to be sustenance for the rest. They even draw straws to see who it should be. But they like the guy. Patrick Dolan is the one who draws a short straw. And they all like him so much that they're like, no, we can't do this. We can't do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's Christmas Eve. They don't have to wait long for sustenance to be provided to them, though. Two people die that night. One, Franklin Graves, tells his two daughters he knows he's dying and they should suck it up, be a man, and eat him. I'm eating. Just so you know, in this situation, if someone dies in natural causes, I'm eating them. I mean, you do what you got to do, right? I, it's, it sounds so horrifying, but like, I don't know. So he's like, tearfully like, look, d- please, I want you to live. I'm dying. Please use my body. Do Do what you need to do. The next day, Patrick Dolan, who everyone was like, no, 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 we can't sacrifice him. He gets so delirious that he runs off into the trees. They go and they find him. They bring him back to camp. But he also then dies, along with the 12-year-old Lemuel Murphy. In despair and desperation, the remaining party members eat those who died. But they make sure no one has to eat their own dead family member, so... God. So once that door's open, it doesn't close. Someone suggests that they kill their Native American guides, Luis and Salvador, who were the only ones who refused to eat human flesh, by the way. Luis and Salvador are warned that they're in danger, and they flee the group. On January 9th... These dates are so far apart, Paula, all the time. I'm like, they're still there on January 9th? Yeah. It's like two weeks later? Yeah. And you know the week after Christmas feels like three weeks anyway. Do you think they celebrated Boxing Day? I don't think they did. (laughs) I genuinely don't think they did. (laughs) They celebrated with a bento box of human meat. Please don't. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm I'm just trying to make it less horrible, but it's pretty horrible. Um... On January 9th, what's left of the group comes upon Luis and Salvador, who are in really bad shape. They're really weak at this point. William Foster out out and out shoots them for food. I've written here gruesome enough for you yet. I feel bad about all of my attempts to lighten this. (laughs) I am failing to lighten this at this point. This is truly... It's horrific. Unbelievably terrible. So finally, 25 days after leaving the camp at Truckee Lake, William Eddy alone makes it through the mountains and brings back help. Only one person makes it the whole way? He's the only one who is strong enough to actually make it out. He's able to bring back help for the six people who are left other than him, (sighs) who were exhausted and weak and lying in the snow. And they're able to find them because their feet They have so much frostbite and no more shoes. They're basically just leaving trails of blood everywhere they walk, right? So they're able to find where these six are left by following his bloody trails back through the snow. They're alive, but they were unable to continue without help. It's interesting, all five women who left survived, and only two of the men. So of the 15, seven make it from the Forlorn Hope. How's everything going back at the camp? Well, funny you should ask. Back at Alder Creek and Truckee Lake, things aren't going so great either. I can't imagine they are. The snow, guess how high the snow is now, Matthew? 15 feet. 20 feet. (laughs) There's apparently, so you can visit like at the lake now. There's like. If you make a snow angel, you would just die. (laughs) You just. (laughs) There's a a monument at the lake now that's um, like 20 feet tall. Meant to, like, mark, like, this is how deep the snow was. Is this, like, a freak winter? I think then? it is, yeah. That can't be normal. It's also, like, it's not normally, it doesn't normally start snowing on Halloween there. Like, they should have had a month. This shouldn't happen. This should not have happened. They're having to dig themselves out of their shelters each morning. So they wake up and, like, the whole door's covered in snow and they have to dig a path yeah. out. Yeah. They're out of food. They can't find any of their cattle that they had killed and buried under the snow to save and be able to eat later because the snow is so deep that any of the markings they put down to be able to find them are completely covered. Are completely gone, yeah. So they're basically like 
wild. There's food there, but they can't eat it, and exactly. the food's refrigerated. Yeah, it's frozen. Wild so with the knowledge. Good f- yeah, of that yeah. exactly. There's good food out there. We just have to find it. But you're going to die finding it. There's nothing for them to hunt. At one point, I think someone kills a bear, but there's very little for them to hunt. So they start boiling the leather hides they're using for their shelter. Yeah. And chewing on them or like reducing them down to like a gluey paste, basically, is what they they basically are eating like glue. People are turning on each other taking hides off of other shelters because that hide came from a cow that I owned. So it's mine and I want it back now. I can't blame people for doing this type of behavior, They're but desperate. it's 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 sheer desperation at this point and we are organisms on in our own right. Yeah. You know, and look, if I'm in a situation like this, I'm probably going to do a few things I'm not very proud of yeah. because I am going to prioritize myself and the people that I love. Yeah. And if that means that the other family dies, you know, it's not like we there's very little to eat and we're all, you know, getting by and, oh, we've only got six loaves of bread and I stole one of their loaves of bread, so I've got a bit... No, it's like there's nothing. There's nothing. There's no food. There's no food at all. Yeah. And it's either I die or you die at that point. It's not we're all uncomfortable. Yeah. It's one of us is dying here. And I'd rather it not be me. And it's not going to be me, essentially, is the way that they are all thinking. And you can't blame them. They're also with their children. Yeah. I tell you right now, my mom would have, would do anything. Yeah. Let's put it that way. It's amazing because there are stories about like, as people start dying and children are becoming orphaned, like other parents who are taking in those children and watching over them and taking care of them. And a lot of um, the children who survived, like writing later about like, you know, oh, uh, Mrs. Murphy took care of all of us and we weren't any of her children. And, you know, like it's. Yeah. So there are good things, too. But yeah. Meanwhile, the banished James Reed has made it out he's gathered help he's gone around he's like they've he's told the story they've raised money someone goes into like a san francisco restaurant and tells the story and people are like i'll help you know they're raising money for these rescue parties and they're attempting to get through the sierras to bring aid to the donner party but the snow is too bad. Just like the Donner Party can't get through from their side, the rescue party can't get through from the other side. Because it's, as well, other than the people who did this by boat, you know, this isn't, there's empathy to be had here because all these people made the same journey yeah. at some point. They've all done it, yeah. They all know what it's like and they go, it's gone really bad for these people. It's like, yeah, it went bad for 20,000 other, 20, other people, you know? So people know it, it, that, that how dangerous this yeah. is. And these are, you know, in in an American spirit, kind of like kindred... That like pioneer spirit, yeah. Manifest destiny, believe in pioneers who have come out and we've got to help our own, you know. So these rescue parties keep trying to go and help and they keep having to turn back. So weather's just too bad. Finally, on February 19th... (laughs) Oh my God. So it's been... They got there on Halloween. Yeah. They've been there almost half a year. The first relief party arrives at Truckee Lake. It's seven men, and they bring a small amount of supplies with them. One of them describes what they see when they enter the camp like this, quote, We saw a woman emerge from a hole in the snow. As we approached her, several others made their appearance in like manner coming out of the snow. They were gaunt with famine. And I can never forget the horrible, ghastly sight they presented. The first woman spoke in a hollow voice, very much agitated, and said, Are you men from California, or do you come from heaven? They'd probably seen people arrive at the camp lots of other times. Yeah. Or thinking... But there was no one there, you know? What am I going to see... When I die, it's going to look like yeah. rescuers. That's what the angels coming to take me home are going to look like. And I bet these people were just, they were rotting yeah. to death because they've got gangrene. They've yeah. got frostbite. They're literally, it's nowhere near the scale, but it must have been like when 
concentration camps were liberated. Oh, yeah, the way people looked. I imagine, yeah, I feel like it's obviously not the Holocaust, but that visual of what people looked like is probably very accurate to what these people looked like. With that in mind, not everyone is strong enough to actually leave the camp. So, yeah, even though there is a rescue party there, there's only seven of them. They can only help so many people, so they have to lead people out in groups, which yeah. often results in splitting up children from parents. So sometimes the parent isn't strong enough to go, and they go, I'll wait, take my kid, please take my kid, or sometimes course, the other yeah. way around. This is my chance to go. I'm going to go get help and come back for you. Did they, did they cannibalize each other at... There are conflicting Tricky. reports, but probably Surely yes. they must have. They must have. How could they not? Because they're not all. They didn't all survive. They. Mu- I mean. I think they probably. They must did. have. There are different. It's nev- never been proven, and we'll talk about this later. But later, after all of this is done, another party, like going east, finds this area, is horrified by what they find, and they burn it all. So there's no. Yeah, they find bodies and. Yeah. Of what happened. And some people say, yes, we did eat each other. And some people are like, that never happened. And so we don't know. But well, probably. maybe they're both telling the truth. Maybe some of them didn't know what was going on in the other tents, you know? Yeah. So the first group of 23 people leaves with the rescuers. 21 of them survive going through the mountains. So two die on the way, but yeah. At this point, I'm like, that's great numbers. Brilliant. 21 people are out. Yeah. As they're on their way, they actually run into a second relief group who's coming the other direction, led by James Reed. It's been five months since he was banished from the Donner Party. And he sees his, but he's still... he sees his wife and two of his children in this first relief group. Alive and okay. And he finds out Gosh. from them that his other two children are back at the camp. But so far, alive and okay. Wow. So he continues on to try to get to his other two children and rescue them. The second relief finally arrives at the camp on March 1st. Yeah. And reportedly finds evidence of cannibalism happening at Truckee Lake. James Reed is reunited with his two other children who are still alive, and they leave the camp along with 15 other party members. God, imagine the nights for James Reed. Knowing, especially trying to rescue his family so soon after they got stuck. Like, he tried to get to them so soon. Like, in November, I think, is when he first struck out and couldn't make it through. To have there's to no wait. way he thought he was finding them. He, there's no way he would have believed that they could have survived. So this second relief company runs into trouble trying to get back through the mountain pass. And they get stuck in the snow for two days. Many of them are too weak to continue. And you have to think at this point, people are like, whatever, I'll just stay here and die. Like, I can't. Like, they just are Because they're not sheltered at this point, are they? They're not... The cabins were... Yeah. I mean, without the cabins, they would all have been dead. They were very lucky in that regard. Well, and that's why in a lot of ways, what Alder Creek, where the Donners were, was worse because they didn't have cabins. They had canvas tents that they were staying in. So... James Reed is determined. He sees everyone in the second relief group too weak to continue giving up. And him and some of his other rescuers take three of the children, two of them being his, and and go. They're like, we will come back for you. Stay here. We are not stopping. We're going to keep going with these three kids. Those left behind become known as starved camp. Three of them die and the other 11 cannibalize the remains. Good. Good that they did that. It's terrible that they died, but yeah. yes, they, sh- they, they, sh- they did the right thing. What helped them live? Five days later, a third relief comes up the mountain and finds the starved camp. One of the rescuers is like, I will stay with them. I will help them get out. Everyone else keep going to Truckee Lake. When the rest gets to Truckee Lake, they will find only nine people still alive, five of whom are strong enough to actually leave. One of those five is Tamson Donner. But she refuses to abandon her dying husband, George. She has sent all of her children on with the earlier relief parties. But her husband, George, who got cut 
when they were fixing the broken axle. He's, it's infected. He's got gangrene. The infection is killing him. And she does not want to leave him while he's dying. Yeah, he's sepsis. Yeah. They must have really loved each other. I mean... So the third relief leaves with just four people. Tamsin stays in her shelter at Alder Creek until the end of March, when finally her husband George dies, and she attempts to leave the camp and cross the mountains. She makes it six miles down the path to Truckee Lake, staying the night in a cabin with Louis Kiesberg, where she dies. On April 17th, the fourth and final relief party makes it to the camp and finds that Louis Kiesberg is the only member of the Donner Party still alive. Imagine being there on your own. He is reportedly surrounded by half-eaten bodies with bones strewn about. He's gone completely... He must have been... The mental state of the person must have been... I would think would be wrecked. Surrounded by your dead friends and family? Yeah. Who you've had to eat? You would think yourself just an animal You're at that hell. point, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. God. The rescuers think he's kind of turned into the villain of this story. He doesn't seem like he was a very nice guy. There were reports that he beat his wife on the trail and and things like that. But the rescuers think that he killed Tamsin Donner because they found him with a large sum of Donner family money on him and like some of the Donner family heirlooms. And they think he killed her to take her money. That doesn't stand to reason but though, that, right? That uh, makes no sense. Yeah, I don't know how much logic there is in that, though at this point, what kind of logic are they operating on? Because like, at this point, I don't think anyone cares about money. <laughs> Later, Kiesberg actually wins a defamation lawsuit because he's like, this false, this was a false report. They came out of here telling everyone that I ate a bunch of people, that I killed Tamsin Donner, and it ruined my reputation. It ruined my life after I was rescued. And he actually won. He won that lawsuit. There's no proof either way. We don't know what happened. Uh, But legally... I think it's just nonsensical to even bring it up into a law. You know what I mean? It's like... Uh, Fun fact, actually. Uh, Thank God. Thank God. (laughs) Kiesberg uh, is credited as the man who introduced lager to California. He opened a brewery. Here he was a German immigrant. He opened a brewery (laughs) and uh, brewed lager. So there you go. He's like, good, I got a drink <laughs> after this. I, need, I will brew it my damn self if I need to. I need to have something to drink. On April 29th, he arrives at Sutter's Fort, the last member of the Donner Party to make it out. That's six months. Yeah. That's the entire length that the trip was supposed to take. 89 people, including Luis and Salvador, were in the Donner Party. 48 made it to California. That's pretty good, given what happened. More than it could have been. (laughs) They could so easily have the snow started a day later and they're not in the cabins and they're all caught out in the wild and they're all dead. Or a day longer crossing the desert and they're all dead. Yeah, yeah. The Breen and Reed families were the only ones to make it through the winter without losing anyone. The only two families to remain intact. What did the other half of the group think? They must have heard. They said, yeah, we split off from them. Yeah, they would have known. They would have made it out and Of course they would. And been like, thank my fucking lucky stars we went to Fort Hall. I suppose they went up north, but I imagine if they'd have gone south that they would have been with the relief group, you'd have to assume, you know? But I I assume that they were were more Oregon way, right, at that point. Some of them were trying to go to California as well. In 1935, Isabella Breen was the last survivor to pass away at the age of 95. She had been the only infant to survive the journey west. Yeah. Why tell this story? It's unbearably horrific and tragic. But it's worth thinking. I think it's worth thinking about the bravery it takes to make big changes. And how brave the Donner Party was. So I hope I've entertained you with the story, of course. There's like... Yeah, it's fascinating. Some stories are fascinating, right? But I hope I've honored these people who fought so hard to overcome the worst situation a person could find themselves in. Well, well done for telling the story. I was... um... 
yeah, I know how you are, and that's difficult to to I do. Just, and I certainly found it very emotional myself, so it's difficult. I kind but of fell in I, love with these people a little. I'm glad I spoke about the Duck King last time because that was fun. <laughs> Even though it ended tragic, it was more fun than this. Oh. During the mall, Mad Mole Man, that was so much fun. Remember how silly that was? Yeah. Um. <laughs> I kind of want to go to where this happened in a, in a sense, you know. The next time you're in California, we could absolutely go. I I believe that if it would have been the time, I would have been the kind of person who would be wanting to make these big leaps of faith yeah. to have a better life. I think if I do think that about myself, I, perhaps we think that about ourselves because we like to think ourselves in a favorable light. But I do feel that way. Yeah. And yeah, that spirit of survival and what you'd have to do and how it's not uniquely American, where, yeah. which you could think of it as, because there's lots of stories like this. I think we like to think of it like it is, but it's not. You're absolutely right. It's not. It doesn't help anyone, but sometimes it's worth thinking about these things and you think about your life and your position and what's going on. And sometimes I can put, I, it helps me put things in perspective sometimes yeah. because, but anyway. Paula, thank you so much for doing this episode. Thank you I for appreciate you so much. Listening to it. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Remember, Remember. They're not all going to be like this. I need the next few episodes to be silly. Yeah, and we need to find some silly things to talk about. I tell you. So thank you so much. If you like this, then please wangle the dangle downstairs right, and tell us, downstairs. you know, like all that and subscribe and all that if you want. But the best way that you can help us out is by telling someone about the show who you think might like the show as much as perhaps you do yourself. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. If you want to listen, we are a podcast first and foremost, so you can always download it wherever you get your podcasts. Paula, thank you so much for putting yourself through this. Hey. I know what you like, so I can't imagine it was fun for you it had its rough moments yeah but it's a story worth telling I and so. honoring in a in a proper way yeah. thanks for watching everyone until next time bye